Good morning, uh, everyone, uh, and welcome to our lecture with uh, Dr. Saeed Nahid. So uh, before starting uh, today's lecture, our guest lecture from Morocco, before introducing our guest lecture, we're very pleased to have to. I'll start with a brief introduction on the uh, notion of the Islamic city or has been written uh, about the Islamic city and then I'll introduce uh, Professor Nahid and then I'll hand it over to him. So uh, a lot has been written of course in the past few uh, decades on the Islamic city, writings of uh, Janat Luhud, Zainab Selik, etc. on the historic myth of the Islamic city, on the Islamic essence and so on and so forth. Uh, Orientalist scholars, for example, Cresswell, uh, Grünebraum, Jacob Lesner, somehow misconstrue traditional Islamic cities due to their preconceptions. So uh, a lot has been written by these uh, Orientalists, by, the, by these authors. They considered, for, for example, Lesner considered the early pattern of growth in al-Basra, al-Kufa, military colonies as fast and lack an awareness of formal city planning. Uh, when discussing medieval Islam, von Grunebaum seems biased towards women's place in society. Even uh, in 1930s, uh, there are some writings about the Medina of Tunis that consider that organic urban fabric as uh, as chaotic. So, under colonization, there, there was misconstruction uh, or misunderstanding of the notion of Islamic city. So, in their views, traditional Islamic settlements uh, and of course, could uh, argue, agree or disagree, were chaotic and lacked formal elements of planning. However, beyond the uh, codes of conduct, religious law, uh, Sharia, and the Ahkam, Ahkam al Bunyan, Ahkam al Nadar, uh, the notion of privacy and related rulings, uh, these did not only shape Muslim social life, but they actually influenced the built environment. They actually influenced the, the way the uh, Islamic city is is shaped, the way the streets are shaped, the way there is hierarchy from the fortifications from the wall uh, all the way to the courtyard. So uh, the way Muslims, uh, not only the way Muslims interacted within the urban uh, uh, sphere or uh, urban context, but also the way they uh, uh, define their setbacks, define the uh, place uh, where they place their windows, their doors, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So the Islamic city is a really, if we want to define it, a complex model of that reflects social cultural codes of uh, this society, of a uh, given society. It reflects those practices of this, uh, the Muslim society. And it also reflects the uh, urban codes, the clear urban codes informed by, uh, to a certain extent, by jurisprudence, by the notion of uh, fiqh. So uh, today uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, Professor Said Nahid join us from Morocco, from Al Akhwain University in Ifran, in the uh, northern northern part of Morocco. So, uh, Professor Said Nahid uh, has earned a PhD from Arizona State University. He's an archaeologist and professor of uh, Islamic art and architecture at the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Al Akhwain University in Ifran, Morocco. Uh, in Nahid's research and teaching interests include Islamic archaeology, art and architecture, and urbanism, medieval historiography and hi historical geography, French colonial period architecture and urbanism, and cultural heritage of contemporary Islamic societies of North Africa. In 2014, uh, in Nahid won a Fulbright Visiting Scholar Award to conduct a project on cities and urban life in medieval Morocco at the uh, Gustav Yvon Grunebaum Center for Near Eastern Studies, UCLA. Uh, the same year, he won the Baraka Trust Senior Visitor Scholarship to continue research on this project at the Khalili Research Center at Oxford University. Uh, in Nahid's current research areas are uh, Islamic manuscript culture and intellectual history, more specifically the use of information communication technologies, uh, ICTs, for the preservation and valorization of cultural heritage in Morocco. That includes archaeological sites, ancient manuscript collections. Uh, also, his work or research focuses on French colonial period architecture history and urbanism with a focus on Casablanca. 
uh, in Nahid uh, is expert member of the International Committee on Historical Towns and Villages, CIVVIH, at the International Council on Monuments and Sites, uh, ICOMOS. So we're very pleased to have you, uh, Professor Nahid, to have you virtually, hopefully next time in person. And I'll hand it over to you to, uh, to tell us more about the city in the Islamic world but with a focus on the Medina Fest. Thank, 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 thank you very, thank you very uh, much, much. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Mejdi, for your generous offer uh, to invite me to uh, speak uh, and to share my uh, research with you, with your my colleagues at the University of Bahrain, with students uh, at the Department of Architecture and uh, Interior Design. Uh, it's really an honor to be invited to talk to, uh, to you guys and to a distinguished uh, audience. Uh, I totally understand that it's uh, at the end of the semester uh, at the University of Bahrain and that the students are basically. It was a difficult time for a lot of for, for students the last year and a half, and I totally understand that there, there is this uh, this screen fatigue and they are just not interested in in it's very hard to get them interested in listening to yet another uh, lecture on uh, on. Um, on, uh, on architectural history and urbanism and all that. So I totally understand that uh, uh, the situation because it's we're, we're facing the same situation here in uh, in, uh, in in Morocco and I'm sure it's the same uh, worldwide. So one more time, thank you so much for 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 inviting me. Uh, the research that I'm going to be uh, presenting today uh, is based essentially to a large extent on research that I conducted almost two decades ago. Uh, I published uh, an article in the Journal of North African Studies uh, in 2002 on uh, access regulation in Islamic uh, uh, urbanism. So most of the discussion today uh, is going to be based on that paper. So feel free to critique it, feel free to challenge some of these ideas. Uh, these are ideas that I formulated when I was a student at Arizona State University. Uh, and I think um, they still have some validity uh, in terms of uh, the, the arguments I'm trying to convey, but I'm really open to critique and open to uh, uh, challenges from colleagues and, and, and students. That's the whole point. The, the, the article has been published, but uh, there is always room for improvement and room for uh, 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 reviewing um, ideas and and basically uh, uh, taking uh, uh, the ideas to a higher level based on input from scholars and students. So what you see here uh, <clears throat> is a snapshot of the city of Fez. Uh, it's a city in northern Morocco located at the northern uh, uh, edge of the rich plain of the Sais, uh, Sais Plains, about 30 kilometers north of the Middle Atlas Mountains, uh, a major source for uh, cedar wood, and uh, for those of you who did work on Fez, uh, uh, wood is a very important uh, element in terms of a structural element, but also a decorative element. We may have a chance to come back to this during the uh, Q&A uh, uh, session. Uh, water is abandoned. As you can see here, there is the river uh, cutting through the city. Uh, there is an explanation as to what happened here. You see that the river uh, stopped here, but, but there is a huge, a very interesting explanation to what happened here. We may go back to this again during the Q&A uh, uh, session. So water provided a secure uh, water supply for homes and industries. I'm talking tanneries, uh, pottery workshops, uh, mills, uh, textile dyeing uh, workshops, uh, all throughout uh, the Middle Ages. Uh, uh, what I'm going to do today, uh, very first of all, I'm going to spend the first few minutes to walk you through the history of the city by looking at uh, 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 three uh, uh, phases, going from the foundation phase, uh, what you see here as Old Fez, uh, Fez al Bali in Moroccan Arabic. Uh, then you have this is basically the foundation phase. We're talking about uh, late uh, 8th century. Then we have another phase, a new phase or Fez al Jadid. Uh, that's the Marinid period, uh, 13th century. And then, of course, we have a very interesting phenomenon that I'm sure Professor Mejdi is familiar with, and maybe uh, some of you guys interested in North Africa, this idea of the dichotomy between the Medina and the Vinouvel, which is the European quarter. So this is the early 20th century, 1912 uh, section uh, of, or addition 
to the urban history of uh, 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 of the city. So it all started uh, uh, with Idris. Idris the first in 789, a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, who built Medinat Fes, as you can see here. Uh, so you see the river, uh, and the first foundation was on this side, uh, <coughs> Medinat Fez, on the right bank of the Wed Fez, to be his dynastic capital and to replace Walila. Uh, Walila uh, uh, is the Amazigh term or the term for volubilis, because when Idris came to Morocco, he actually settled in a in a pre-Islamic city or pre-Islamic site called Volubilis and made that into his uh, 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 origin or his first capital. And we have uh, that numismatic evidence. We have coins with the name of Walila, Duribabi Walila, Senate, and then you have the year. So we know uh, based on numismatic evidence that the first Idris capital was actually in uh, at Volubilis on a site on a on a Roman site. But very quickly he decided to build a, a capital of his own. And that's where uh, um, Thus, basically, he, he scouted the countryside and chose this very uh, interesting spot right here to become uh, his capital, Medina Fez. And of course, we have also numismatic evidence attesting uh, 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 to that. But very quickly, 20 years later, his son, Idris II, uh, built uh, another city on the on the on the on the opposite side of the river, which became the seat of his government. Uh, shortly afterwards, around 818, 8,000 families sought refuge uh, at Medina Fez, uh, at the, the right-hand side, uh, after having been uh, expelled from Spain by the Omayyads of Cordoba. So that basically marks the first uh, 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 phase in terms of, uh, how to call it, uh, in, terms, in terms of having the first cohort of immigrants. So the first cohort of immigrants came from Spain, from El Andalus, and that gave the name the Andalusian Adwa or Adwa al Andalusian to this side, because uh, uh, shortly afterwards, uh, 2,000 families came from Qairawan uh, and settled on this, the opposite side. And these events will mark the urban and social history of Fez for centuries to come. They gave rise to two distinct and often and oftentimes rival towns, Adwat al-Andalus, uh, or Adwat al-Andalusiyin on this side, and uh, 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 Adwat al-Qarawiyin uh, on this opposite side. And you can see here that each one of these two sections had its own congregational mosque or jami. So we have um, at the Al-Andalus mosque, as you can see here in this spot, and the Qarawiyin mosque uh, uh, in this spot right here. Uh, the, uh, before getting to the next, before getting to another element of this uh, foundation history, I just want to show you maybe a couple of slides showing uh, 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 a view of the city, and you recognize uh, uh, the minaret of the Qarawiyin Mosque. So basically, the two main buildings in the city uh, are the Qarawiyin Mosque, which is uh, um, uh, a major, major monument in terms of uh, uh, architectural history in Morocco and one of the oldest mosques in Morocco, and you have the site or the burial place of Idris II. Remember, we have Idris I and Idris II. Idris I, for uh, 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 all kinds of reasons that we may come back to, uh, is buried actually near, near Walila, near Volubilis, whereas his son Idris II is buried in Fez. And these two sites are considered today extremely important uh, and gave this kind of spiritual uh, uh, feel to the city. It is actually considered until today as the spiritual capital of uh, of, uh, of Morocco. Maybe a couple of slides just to give you some sort of uh, insight on the, on this uh, interesting monument. Uh, 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 by the way, Fez is also extremely important to sub-Saharan uh, uh, African Muslims because uh, in addition to the burial place of Idris, because he's now considered as a, a holy person or as a saint. There are a number of uh, holy sites in the city, including uh, 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 I think you're uh, muted, uh, Dr. Saeed. You just is muted. It, is it good now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, so there are a number of uh, uh, burial places of a number of uh, holy figures in the city, and today the city is considered as uh, a spiritual city in uh, in uh, in uh, in Morocco. So the rise. Rose for some reason. Can you see my next slide? Hello? Yes. Okay, okay great. Yes. Perfect. So the rise of power or the rise to power of the Almoravid uh, of the Saharan of the Sahara marks a turning point in the urban history of Fez. In 1070, uh, Yusuf in Tashfin leveled uh, the fortifications that used to divide the rival towns and united them with a single uh, fortification. So what you see here is the situation uh, around the late 11th century when the Almoravid took over the city of Fez. Remember, Fez was an important city in Morocco all throughout the, 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 the history of Morocco until today, actually. Uh, 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 and one of the contributions of the Almoravids is to unite the city because before the Almoravid dynasty, as you can see here, we were looking at two rival cities, you know, the foundation of Idris I, Medina Fez, and the foundation of his son, uh, uh, Al-Aliya, uh, the sublime, and the river in between. And you can see how the two cities were basically uh, uh, indep almost independent from each other with uh, separate sets of fortifications and gates and, and congregational mosques, etc. So the, the contribution of the Almoravids is to unite uh, 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 these two cities. So these fortifications will be raised again uh, in 1145 and built anew by the al uh, uh, uh ruler, and nasir in 1212, using uh, uh, tabia or cab work, a uh, very interesting building uh, technique. Again, I hope we will have a chance to uh, talk about it a little more during the Q&A session, which is actually an al technique of construction uh, that is uh, that was used for building a number of uh, city walls in, uh, in, uh, in, in Morocco. And the fortifications uh, enclosing the city today date actually to this uh, uh, period. And then we have, remember, we have the first square saying Old Fez and the second square saying uh, New Fez. So that's the New Fez, uh, Fez al jadid uh, 1276. So it was built under the Marinid dynasty, uh, uh, and during this dynasty, or the, during the rule of this dynasty, Fez witnessed a period of unprecedented uh, urban, economic, and cultural growth. Uh, it regained its status as capital, as dynastic capital, because remember, under the Almoravid, the, 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 the capital was relocated from Fez to Marrakesh. So Marrakesh was the capital of the Almoravid dynasty. By the time we get to the Marinid dynasty, Fez regain again its status as dynastic capital. However, due to lack of building space and possibly to bring their own imprint, the Marinids built a new administrative district complete with its own fortifications, uh, a congregational mosque, and a royal palace to the west of the, of the old Idrisid city. The new foundation was officially named Medinat, uh, al Medina al-Bayda, but today uh, it is commonly known as uh, Fes al-Jadid as opposed to Fes al-Bali. And then we have the last phase in terms of the urban history of the city, and that's 1912. Remember, Morocco was the French protectorate from 1912 to 1956. And of course, there is a huge uh, uh, body of literature as to the contribution of uh, basically uh, a huge body of literature on what we call today colonial period architecture in Morocco and in North Africa in general, uh, in terms of orthogonal planning, in terms of the introduction of motor vehicles, introduction of all kinds of, uh, of elements uh, into the urban landscape of, uh, of Morocco. As a matter of fact, a place like Casablanca was considered as a laboratory for trying new things that even before being tried in, in the metropolis in, in Paris. So the last imp important episode of the urban history of the city date to 1912, with the signing in Fez of the treaty uh, establishing the French protectorate in Morocco. In line with, with, in, in line with Lute, Lute is the name of the French resident general in Morocco. So in line with his policy to preserve the cultural history, uh, sorry, the cultural identity, 
of the of, uh, of what the French used to call la ville indigène, the indigenous city. Uh, today, it's considered as a pejorative term to use the term indigène or indigenous. But the French use, I mean, in the literature, it's very common to find the term or, or the expression uh, or uh, la ville indigène. And he built a whole new city, la ville nouvelle, or the new city or the European city to the south of Fessel Jadid with modern administrative buildings, European residential quarters and a modern street system to accommodate uh, motor traffic. In 1981, the Medina of Fez was declared UNESCO World Heritage Site. However, uh, the Medina today needs uh, 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 urgent programs of, of salvage and, re and re re rehabilitation to preserve its monuments and its urban fabric. Of course, there are all kinds of initiatives, uh, government initiatives to restore buildings. Uh, many, many madrasas have been restored. Many buildings have been, historic buildings have been restored. Uh, the government is really trying to bring back uh, uh, this kind of aura uh, that Fez had uh, in, in, in medieval times. But of course, with all kinds of, there are all kinds of challenges, demographic challenges, socio uh, uh, economic challenges, uh, 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 etc. So that's just a brief uh, 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 contextualizing uh, uh, historical uh, uh, and, and somehow uh, political history of, uh, of, of the city. Now let's get to the actual topic uh, of today, which is uh, access regulation in Islamic urbanism. So uh, one of the defining features uh, uh, of Islamic societies is the social and architectural demarcation between the public and private spaces. Uh, Islamic urbanism uh, reflects the social and religious prescriptions of ensuring that each member of society enjoys full rights to a secure and inviolable pri uh, private space. A full account of these social and religious prescriptions is beyond the scope of today's talk. Indeed, I will analyze the various settlement units within the Islamic urban society in order to determine the structural mechanism, the structural uh, architectural mechanisms designed to respond to these prescriptions. In other words, this paper or this talk will investigate how access is regulated in Islamic urbanism and discuss the implications of such regulation on society and on the architecture and urbanism of the Islamic city. And Medieval Fez offers an excellent case study for this type of investigation. Uh, in this talk, access regulation will be analyzed at four hierarchical levels. So we're going to go from the micro level to the macro level. We're going to start with the courtyard house, then we zoom out to the house compound, then to the quarter, and then to the city at large. Uh, each hierarchical level will be determined, sorry, will be examined in terms of the social, uh, ethnic, or occupational group or groups that reside in it and the structural uh, architectural manifestations of access regulation. So I'm going to start with uh, 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 the smallest unit, uh, architectural unit or, or, or social unit uh, within the Islamic city, which is the courtyard house. It is the smallest unit of settlement. Uh, it is occupied by a nuclear family, mm, husband and wife and their children. Uh, the Muslim dwelling is the ultimate haven for privacy and security. Uh, several passages from Quran and from the Sunnah of the Prophet uh, uh, clearly set the rules uh, for proper behavior in terms of access to private space. However, the prescriptions found in the Quran and the prophetic traditions only meant to provide or were only meant to provide the spirit of the law huh? in, and that needed to be elaborated on through uh, fiqh, huh? through Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, something that I'm really hoping to see Mejdi, Professor Mejdi will tell us more about in terms of Fiqh al-Bunyan or Ahkam al-Bunyan. In other words, the Quran and the Sunnah did not outline the specifics of how space was to be regulated and negotiated uh, in Islamic society. In the course of Islamic history, Muslim judges and jurists faced were faced with numerous grievances for which there was uh, there were no provisions in the primary sources of Sharia, Quran and Sunnah. So the judges, the judges had to come up with all kinds of rules and all kinds of regulations to basically uh, uh, mitigate this kind of uh, 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 
uh, litigations uh, amongst urbanites. Now let's look at a schematic plan of, uh, of a typical uh, 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 Moroccan traditional house or domestic unit. Uh, with the exception of the main entrance door, as you can see here, uh, there is really any opening onto the street with the exception of the occasional mashrabiya, uh, lattice woodwork. The courtyard functions as the primary source of lighting and ventilation to domestic unit. Being an essentially introverted space, the Moroccan traditional house does not reveal its secrets and charms to outsiders. In fact, the exterior of Moroccan traditional houses uh, is, is totally deceiving with high and blank walls with, 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 which forms the dark and tortuous alleyways so characteristics of medinas such as, for example, Fez or Tunis or Marrakesh or, or Rabat. Uh, 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 this kind of narrow, dark, uh, uh, winding uh, uh, street network. At the level of the individual house, the main architectural feature used to regulate access to the exterior, sorry, to the interior, is what we call here the bent access entryway. This is a defining feature of access regulation. This angled entrance ensured that no direct view onto the house was possible. So if you're standing here, uh, and the house, uh, and we open the door, you're actually looking at a, at a, at a wall on this side. Uh, uh, you're faced with, you're not, you, you don't have access to, to, to the interior of, 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 of the house. So the bent access entryway opens onto one of the corners of the central courtyard around which open all the main rooms uh, in the house. The bent access entryway and the central courtyard are the most characteristic features of Maghribi and arguably all Islamic domestic uh, architecture. These features are religiously maintained regardless of the constraints of building space since we found them even in houses of very small size. Uh, here is a, an example of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, a courtyard house. As you can see here, uh, 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 the courtyard is the main source of light and ventilation. Notice how the windows are on the inside, uh, very big windows on the inside because the, they are ne needed to capture maximum amount of light and ventilation to bring them inside or to uh, 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 allow light and ventilate, allow light and fresh air inside the rooms. Uh, main, a uh, big, 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 big uh, openings to the rooms. Again, the same idea. Bring in a lot of bring in light and ventilation because the rooms do not have access to the outside. Usually there is a fountain in the middle, and basically uh, the courtyard is the main. It's the heart of the house. This is where all the activities are conducted. Uh, you see that there is this uh, uh, corridor or this uh, this uh, this uh, 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 galleries to allow uh, movement uh, from one room to the other when it is too hot because you have the shade, uh, 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 there are basically shaded corridors, or when it rains, doesn't rain a lot, but when it rains, you also have this kind of passageways to allow you to move from one room to the other. I mean, there is uh, all kinds of literature, especially in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, for example, I have here the I'm thinking of the work of Fatima El Mernisi, who wrote her biography, uh, Dreams of Trespass. And it's you have some beautiful passages in this biography uh, 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 portraying uh, life of this uh, young girl or young woman living in this kind of uh, confined spaces. Maybe uh, we'll have a chance to come back to this book uh, during the Q&A session. So beside its role of providing the Muslim family with a space that is architecturally open and socially restricted. Uh, the central courtyard also responds to specific climate climatic conditions in areas with a very short rainy season and a long hot and dry summer. The courtyard is an efficient cooling and ventilation device. Uh, it's very similar. Well, the idea is very similar, or the principle is very similar to what you see in the Middle East in terms of the uh, 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 the feature known as the, the wind towers, malqafs or barjils. We don't have that in Morocco to the best of my knowledge, but it's the same principle. 
the, the, the courtyard in Moroccan traditional homes is the equivalent, or in terms of, uh, of, of function, the equivalent of, uh, of the Malqaf or the Barjil in the, in, uh, in, in the Gulf, uh, uh, in the Gulf countries. So the courtyard retains cool air trapped at night and releases it during the day when it is most needed. <clears throat> a, a small courtyard is usually preferred to a large one since the former continues to be in the shade for a long period of time during the day. It helps to retain a lower temperature inside the house. The same principle applies to the layout and width of the streets and alleyways in the Medina. They are kept really small and winding with high walls to protect the houses from dust laden winds and to reduce the time during which the exterior walls are exposed to direct sunlight and to prevent the wind from chasing from chasing out the cool air trapped at night. And I have this feeling uh, uh, whenever I visit Fez, uh, uh, for example, in the middle of the of the of the summer season, and I'm sure Professor Mejdi had the same feeling, either in Fez or in Tunis or in other medinas in North Africa. Uh, if you're coming from the European quarter in the middle of uh, of August and you want to take a walk in the Medina, you will uh, you will feel it. The temperature will drop several degrees the moment you step in, you cross the gate of the Medina, because of this principle of uh, high walls narrow streets, winding streets that helps trap cool air and have these shaded areas. And that uh, uh, usually works in terms of uh, 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 reducing temperature and, 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 uh, and uh, basically making it a very comfortable space uh, when it's too hot uh, in the summer season. Something that the Europeans did not really use in their uh, colonial period architecture, but of course they have other mechanisms for uh, 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 dealing with uh, the, 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 the heat during the summer season. Remember, we're talking the early 20th century, uh, introduction of electricity, the use of fans, uh, uh, etc. We may again discuss these issues uh, uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, this is just something I'm going to skip, but uh, but if you want me to come back to, I will be happy to do this. Uh, just to discuss, uh, I teach uh, uh, an art history class, arch Islamic art and architecture, and usually uh, my students and uh, my audience is very interested to learn about this technique called Moroccan Zilij, you know, the technique of tile work how these walls were decorated and how this floor is decorated, uh, uh, the technique of stucco. Uh, I will skip that because we're running out of time, but I'll be more than happy to come back to it if you if you want me to. Uh, uh, this is not a house, this is a madrasa, but you can see clearly here the same principles in terms of architectural decoration, the use of uh, tile work, Moroccan zilij, the use of stucco, uh, plaster, uh, sculpted plaster, and the use of sculpted wood. Uh, this is cedar wood from the Middle Atlas. Remember, Fez was uh, located uh, 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 very close to uh, the, the cedar wood forest uh, in the Middle Atlas. Uh, so uh, again, I will skip this. This is uh, Abu Inania Madrasa, the same principle. So Moroccan homes, uh, public spaces uh, are usually decorated with these three elements. So these are basically, this is almost like a signature of Moroccan traditional architectural decoration. You know, Zilij at the lower, uh, at, the, at, the, at the lower, at the, at the, you have this kind of uh, Lower level, horizontally speaking, with Zilij, with, with Moroccan tile work, uh, 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 stucco and cedar wood. And of course, when in public building, you have also epigraphy and you have all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of additional features. Again, I can, I can come back to this if you want me to do, to, to do that. How Zilij is made, I can come back to this if you, if you, if you like. Okay. Uh, the earliest this what what the, what this slide shows uh, 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 this is the earliest example of the bent axis entryway uh, uh, documented through archaeology. Uh, when I was a, a graduate, uh, actually an undergraduate student, I participated at uh, uh, digs at this Moroccan archaeological site. Yes, it is called Al Basra, so we have uh, the same toponym in Morocco. Uh, something. Uh, can you see me, guy? Everything is. Something happened. I can see your uh, uh, the. Uh, so you, you, everything is okay. Yes, the point. Okay. Is 
thank you. For some reason, I thought something happened. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we have this archaeological site called Al Basra, same name. I mean, uh, uh, it's published uh, if you Google it. This is an Idrisid site, but uh, what is of interest to me is arguably this is the earliest archaeological evidence of a bent axis entryway. Uh, because you can see clearly here from this archaeological uh, from this uh, uh, archaeological site, you have the rooms and then you have the bent axis entryway clearly indicated uh, on this slide. So this is a uh, 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 9th, uh, 11th century archaeological site. This is another site in Morocco. Uh, I did not participate in this dig, but you can see clearly here from this archaeological site, uh, 12th, 13th century, uh, a typical uh, Moroccan traditional home, uh, uh, the bent axis entryway. So if you're standing here, you're looking at a wall, you don't have access, you don't have a visual corridor inside uh, 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 um, uh, inside the, 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 the domestic unit. Uh, now let's move to, remember, we're looking at several hierarchical level. So I showed you the first hierarchical level, which is the, the domestic unit, you know, the, 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 the courtyard house. Now I'm going to zoom out to what I call the house compound. OK, so what you see here is a is a. OK, uh, I lost my slide. I don't know what happened. Please bear with me. Sure. Can no you problem. see my slide now? Yes. OK, great. So let's zoom in. Huh? What you see here is uh, 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 the city fest from above. You recognize all the this you, all the courtyards. Notice how the courtyard is a signature of the Moroccan traditional home. Uh, you see all these wells. Uh, these are basically courtyards, both in public buildings. I don't see public building here, but uh, but anyway, you can see how the courtyard is uh, almost a signature of the Moroccan traditional home. But if we zoom in, uh, one of these. We go from the level of the of the domestic unit to the level of the court uh, of the what I call the house compound. What you see here. So this is uh, uh, basically a, a neighborhood. We will, we will get to the unit to the neighborhood level shortly. But if we zoom in from one house to a house compound, we're going to see something different. So what you see here is an aggregation of several courtyard houses. Uh, uh, occupied usually by an extended family headed by a patriarch. Remember Moroccan society in the past, things have changed today, but in the past Moroccan society was very uh, uh, patriarchal, very conservative. So as with the courtyard house, the layout of the house compound is meant to regulate access and ensure maximum privacy to its occupant. Uh, 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 at times, this was achieved at the expense of public space which was encroached upon almost systematically. The house compound forms a closed architectural complex composed of several individual domestic units sharing a common entryway. So what you see here is if you're coming from neighborhood A to neighborhood B, you would basically use this street. And then from this street, you will get into one of these house compounds. So usually what you see here are uh, 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 an aggregates of courtyard houses, but they are usually uh, 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 occupied by members of the same extended family, something like this. Huh? So you're coming from outside, and then you get into this cul-de-sac. And what you see here is, schematically speaking, three houses, three courtyard houses, and they are usually members of the same extended family. Okay. So this starts from the streets and forms a cul-de-sac, the cul-de-sac or uh, or dead end. So the location of a gate at the street results in the cul-de-sac becoming an extra private space used exclusively by the occupants of the house compound. Because we have evidence, we have archaeological evidence of gates at this level also. So we have a gate at the level of the unit, domestic unit, and we have some examples where even the cul-de-sac uh, uh, is gated to provide a buffer zone, a buffer zone for privacy to the extended family. An example showing you uh, a, a typical cul-de-sac. 
So in fact, the cul-de-sac is an integral component of the court of the quarter structure. Uh, in just one single quarter of the Medina, there are no less than 15 cul-de-sac. Another example. Uh, do, remember what I was talking about earlier, how the, 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 the street system, uh, this is a cul-de-sac, but it's the same principle. It's very narrow. And you see the blank walls uh, that gives you somehow a misleading idea about uh, the house, because from the outside, it looks really boring and austere. But the moment you walk in, uh, 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 or you step in uh, uh, the, the, the house, you're, you, you're, you're usually overwhelmed by the amount of architectural decorations, the leash, stucco, woodwork, uh, uh, and, and you're bathing in light uh, uh, from the, from, with all the light coming from the courtyard. So notice what you see here. Uh, this is one neighborhood, and look at the shaded areas. All these shaded areas are basically domestic units served by cul-de-sac. So we have here no less than 15 uh, cul-de-sac in this single neighborhood. Uh, furthermore, spatial analysis of these quarters show this particular one uh, uh, shows that access to two thirds of its domestic units, uh, two thirds of its domestic units is regulated via cul-de-sac. When an alternative point of access is available, the occupants invariably use the one that opens onto the cul-de-sac. So without understanding, and this is something uh, uh, that Professor Mejdi was talking about in the introduction, without under understanding the social structure of the Muslim family unit and the nature of the kinship relations within the house compound, it is easy to dismiss, just like what Orientalists did. did. It's, easily to it's easy to dismiss the profusion of the cul-de-sac or cul-de-sacs in the Medina as a result of ad hoc building practices and chaotic planning. This is especially the case for a number of early 20th century Western scholars and travelers whose reference model was the Greek or Roman city with its well-defined orthogonal plan. Now let's move on from the, 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 the second level, which is the, the house compound to the quarter level, okay? You have here two quarters, one from Fez and one from Damascus, but it's the same principle. Uh, notice how the quarter is also uh, a very uh, uh, demarcated in space uh, with this uh, bold line. Uh, notice how it is served and linked to the rest of the city, usually by a main street that serves uh, uh, the different house compounds and the different domestic units. And notice how it's usually gated. It says here in French, porte, French for gate. Uh, porte, French for gate. And notice how all the necessities or all the necessary amenities are actually uh, 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 located or uh, available within the confines of the neighborhood. You have the neighborhood mosque. And remember, this is different from uh, the jamia. This is the masjid. So this is a neighborhood mosque, usually closed on Fridays, because in medieval times, the neighborhood population would have to go to the, the jamia, to the main uh, 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 congregational mosque of the city, to usually attach to the royal palace or to the governor palace, to governor's palace for the for the khutbah, for the Friday sermon. This one is a neighborhood mosque for the five daily prayers, and also used as a kutab for teaching children uh, the basics of religion. So you have the, the masjid, you have the hammam, you know, the, the public bath. You have the a small market for the basics uh, or to provide or to uh, cater to the basic to the basic necessities for the neighborhood, for the, 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 the quarters uh, population. You have the bakery and you have a fountain among many other uh, amenities basically serving this kind of close microcosm. So the Islamic city lacks uh, an orthogonal plan, which consequently makes it difficult to delimit quarter boundaries. This is especially the case of the Medina of Fez, where the rigid prescriptions of access regulation actually defines the very essence of a residential quarter. A real quarter, according to Le Tourneau, is the sum of all the, the cul-de-sac and small streets that branch off a main artery or lead to one. 
as opposed to Western cities where it is usually the street that marks the boundary between two quarters. In Fez, such a boundary is very elusive, especially to outsiders. Quarter boundaries are made of, the, of a divided line, ligne de partage in French, that cuts through the house compounds instead of running around them. For example, two domestic units, for example, if there is a house, let's think of this house and the next house attached to it. Yes, they are attached to each other, but house A and house B are actually uh, 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 part of two different quarters. This is very different, uh, very hard to understand for someone who does not really know the mechanisms uh, of access regulation in Islamic uh, 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 urbanism. Uh, the main public facilities, such as the mosque, the, 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 the shops and bakeries and fountains, are usually uh, located within the perimeter of the quarter, as I was talking about earlier. Now I'm going to take a, maybe a few. How am I? How am I? How am I? How am I, how am I doing on time, C Professor Mijdi? Am I okay? Uh, I mean, we started late, so let's say 15 more minutes. Oh, 15. 15. Okay, so I have to, to wrap up very quickly. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about uh, uh, because remember the population of a, of a neighborhood is usually uh, tightly linked or tightly tied, uh, tightly um, uh, or affiliated to the same either ethnic group. I'm talking historically speaking, ethnic group or tribal group or religious group. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about religious affiliation and talk about the Mallah. Uh, 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 the Mallah is the term used in Morocco for the Jewish neighborhood. So this is the city, as you can see, and notice how the Mallah is actually attached to the royal palace, and the, the, there is an explanation for that. So the Mallah is a, a neighborhood that is exclusively uh, uh, occupied, or uh, that is an exclusively Jewish space, uh, or space used for or to host the Jewish population. The earlier Malah or the earliest Malah in Morocco dates to uh, to the, the the early 15th century. But please, I'm not saying that the Jews were not there before. Uh, remember that, uh, according to his textual evidence, it was Idris II who gave permission to the Jews to settle in the newly founded city of Fez and to have their own quarter close to the northern section of the city. Uh, in exchange of a jizya of 30,000 uh, dinars. So there is some sort of relocation. First of all, there is a chronological, uh, 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 chronological, how to put it? Uh, 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 trying to find the exact way to say this. So the Jews were there from the very beginning, uh, from the early, from the, I would say, late 8th century when Fez was, was, was founded. So that's the first element that needs to be clarified. And what happened here is uh, the first Mallah, meaning the re relocation of the Jews from the northern section of the city to the, the, the Fes al Jadid. So that's, it should be, I don't want this to be misleading. Uh, the, the early 15th century, that's the relocation. But Jewish populations were there from the very uh, foundation phase, from the very beginning of the, of the foundation of the, from the very beginning of the urban history of the city. And what you see here are examples of other Malahs in Morocco, in other cities, Marrakesh, Meknes, Rabat, uh, etc. Uh, again, if, if I have time, we may come back to this, discussing how life was regulated inside the Malah in terms of uh, the dichotomy of authorities, a Muslim authority, a Jewish authority, and the key players uh, uh, within each realm, political realm, we can come back to this if if you want me to do that. We can also come back to this in terms of uh, uh, population size and how you have a large population confined within a very small space, and this would have an impact on uh, 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 um, how uh, uh, some of the how some of the houses in the in the Malah had a, adopted a very different design than their counterparts in the in the Muslim city. This is just something uh, that maybe some of you are familiar with. You know, this huge drop in uh, Jewish population in Morocco with the creation of the state of Israel. So from 250,000, uh, uh, um, from a population, Jewish population of 250,000, today, in the, or at least early uh, 1980s, 
uh, we have about 5,000 Moroccan Jews still living in Morocco today, as opposed to 250,000 uh, in 1950s and 60s. Uh, for those of you interested in learning more about Moroccan Judaism, uh, there is this uh, uh, museum in Casablanca with a website, the, the Le Musée de Judaïsme Marocain, you know, m m the Museum of Moroccan Judaism. You can check it out. It has a really very rich uh, gallery with all kinds of documents, uh, photographs, uh, texts, uh, uh, images of, 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 of uh, the material culture that used to be part of Jewish heritage in Morocco, etc. Uh, this is one of the neighborhoods of the Mellah. Notice how it's very different from what we were talking about so far. So instead of uh, the courtyard, you have balconies because remember that uh, Jewish homes or the Jewish or the Mellah is uh, the area of the Mellah is small for the large population, the Jewish population living in the Mellah, and they had to basically. Uh, uh, use these balconies to get as much light and ventilation to uh, to bring that to their homes as opposed to um, courtyards. Uh, you see how the balconies are blocked today because uh, uh, many, as I was saying earlier, all these families who migrated to Israel, uh, their homes were uh, now are now occupied by Muslim families, and many Muslim families felt that. The, court, the, the balconies were just too open for their taste or to their taste uh, uh, and they basically blocked the view. So you can see how you have two populations, a Jewish population and a Muslim population adopting different uh, mechanisms for uh, uh, or solutions. Uh, uh, in this case, the balconies were meant to provide light and ventilation, but the moment the Jews left, you have Muslim families feeling that the balcony is just too open uh, and they had to block that. Uh, that's the third level uh, of hierarchy, which is the city. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's uh, basically uh, uh, evident in terms of access regulation. So the city uh, constitutes the highest hierarchical unit of settlement in, in Islamic urbanism. Access to the city is controlled at the level of the, the at the central level a prince or a governor or a military office, uh, of officer or official in order to build a city with the uh, fortifications and, and, and watchtowers and what have you, a central authority is needed to mobilize the necessary workforce to supervise the construction and to maintain and control such elaborate access regulation apparatus. Access re regulation, however, can also be discussed in terms of private and public uh, space, as well as in terms of the layout of the city's road system. The strict rules regulating access to the different settlement units resulted in large areas of the city becoming restricted or private space and a complex road system that was both introverted and exclusive. Several scholars have noted the high ratio of private interior space to public exterior space within the Islamic city. So this is just to say, uh, uh, briefly that obviously the access is regulated through city gates uh, and to uh, uh, city fortifications. But what is really interesting is the, the variability in terms of the use of space within the city with a high ratio of private space as opposed to uh, 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 a public space. And in the article, I give examples from uh, a number of cities in Morocco. Now let me move to the last part of my discussion with maybe three or four minutes or so to talk about the road system. So what you see here as a chaotic road system, there is actually logic to it. OK, uh, 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 as you can see, as you will see here, uh, as you see in this slide. So the road system of the Islamic city uh, was not laid out according to a preconceived plan. As stated by Le Tournou, the French uh, scholar who worked on Fez, Muslim cities in North Africa, this is a quote, Muslim cities in North Africa were not laid out according to street plans. The location of the street was determined by the arrangement of the buildings. The Islamic city in this regard is in total contrast to its Greco-Roman counterpart. A classic plan of a Roman city is made of a square, as you can see here, <clears throat> or rectangle crossed by two per 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 perpendicular uh, streets, as you can see here, there's one here, and there is one here. Uh, the north, south, and east 
West Main Streets are the Cardo and the Decumanus, respectively. The city gates are located at equidistant, are located equidistant from the point where the Cardo and the Decumanus uh, uh, intersects. And of course, this intersection marks the place or the location of the main public uh, uh, amenities or facilities. The road system in the Medina. Uh, developed from random circumstances and prior occupation of building space by domestic units. With the exception of a few main arteries leading to the center of the city, streets constitute in essence an extension of the domestic slash private space or a buffer zone around it. Access to domestic units and residential blocks is restricted by the construction of gates, as you can see here. So you, so you have the the, the, the gate to the main gate to the city. You have gates to the different neighborhoods. Uh, you have gates to the different uh, 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 quarters. And of course, you have gates to the different uh, 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 house compounds uh, for extended families. Uh, and of course, notice how the, the, the size decreases as you move from the major traffic arteries, uh, the main traffic arteries of the city, uh, usually there are maybe two. For example, in the case of Fez, you can recognize one of them. Uh, going all the way to the Qarawiyin. So coming from the main gate and going all the way to the Qarawiyin. And there is another one going this way. Uh, please ignore this one. There is an explanation uh, for what happened to the river. Today it is a, a, a major uh, street but that's actually the river that had been blocked or built upon uh, uh, to basically provide more to, to allow motor traffic inside the city. We can discuss this uh, later if you wish. So if we go back, notice how the what looks as a chaotic uh, uh, design, there is actually logic to it, as you can see here. Uh, what is happening here? For some reason. Is it is it frozen? Uh, am I OK now? Yes, I can see your uh, cursor. Okay. Great. So so there is a logic to it uh, uh, going from major traffic arteries, very large, more than usually uh, more than five meters or at least minimum of five meters to allow two fully loaded camels to uh, to 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 pass each other. And of course, we if we have time, we could also talk about uh, uh, rooms bridging the streets and all the kinds of rules and regulations in Ahkam al Bunyan to basically accommodate uh, uh, traffic without, uh, while at the same time allowing uh, uh, the residents to accommodate or to build extra space. Uh, the notion of la darara wa la dirar. And notice how the the width of this. Uh, different hierarchies of the street system decreases as you move from the main street all the way to the cul-de-sac, which is really, really small, as you can see, really, really tight, as you can see here, sometimes uh, less than half, uh, half, uh, half a meter, 50 centimeters in width. And we have, of course, uh, the example of the uh, uh, of one of the neighborhoods. OK, so if we go from 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 this level, uh, you get to an example uh, of this neighborhood where you can see that there is the main uh, 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 the main street that basically branch offs uh, to serve the different house compounds and the different uh, 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 domestic units. Uh, here is an example, uh, an old image uh, of uh, one of the streets of Fez. For some reason, I lost my slide. OK, so this is an example of. Uh, oops, give me just one second. Uh, this is an example of one of those major traffic arteries. This is where you have basically most of the commercial activities. Uh, this is where you have most of the funduks. In Morocco, we use the term funduk. I think in the Middle East, they use the term uh, uh, wakala or wikala. Uh, and of course, even today, these are really vibrant places, picturesque, picturesque places where you have all kinds of commercial activities and all kinds of colorful displays of goods where people until today are still, you know, enjoying uh, this kind of uh, model where uh, you can get all the, the, the you know, the, all the services uh, uh, and all the kind, uh, all kinds of uh, goods are now uh, available, just like the way they were in the past 
uh, along this uh, major traffic arteries that are extremely beautiful, extremely interesting visually and architecturally uh, 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 for both local population and for, for, for visitors. That's all I have for today. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to your uh, uh, questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Saeed. I appreciate your presentation on Islamic urbanism and the case of uh, the rich case of Medina Fes. So, uh, as I mentioned in the chat box, we'll take questions for the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so, please raise your hand or, or just jump in and share your question. Okay, uh, Zainab, please go ahead and mute yourself and Okay, um, so um, I just want to thank you for this very interesting presentation. Um, it was very interesting how we get to um, we get to understand how our values sort of get um, illustrated through our through the architecture, through our through our vernacular architecture. Um, I would like. I would like to ask if you have any readings that elaborates further on this topic. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Zainab, for uh, for your for your question and for your interest in in what we do. Uh, I would definitely uh, first. Uh, 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 whenever I talk about the dates of this article, I feel old. Uh, uh, this is almost two decades now. Uh, 2002. I will share uh, this uh, document as a PDF. I'm taking. No um, note to self is i will share this document with the uh, with the uh, published on uh, uh, journal of north african studies i actually shared it during your presentation in the chat right. box so please go to the chat box i shared your uh, academia profile and the uh, this research article thank you so in my academia profile uh, you will see this article you will see i mean there is also another one coming up that that takes you to what happened after 1912 meaning uh, the kind of mechanisms of uh, that were in place or that were put in place by by the French uh, in Moroccan cities. But uh, Ms. Zainab, feel free to download uh, this one because it has also some interesting uh, references related to uh, the Islamic city and all kind of mechanisms and all kinds of issues, uh, 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 at least up to 2002. But I'm sure Professor Mejdi, uh, Mejdi's work has some some later references as to this issue of the Islamic city and the design and Ahkam al-Bunyan, etc. I would also highly recommend uh, uh, this book by uh, by uh, uh, this is a seminal work a seminal work in the field uh, Arabic Islamic cities planning and uh, building and planning principles by Basim Hakim. I'm sure uh, the University of Bahrain's library has a copy uh, that you could uh, uh, look at. But thank you for your question. Thank you very much. So we have a question from uh, Dr. Tamadar. Please go ahead if you want to uh, share your question, Dr. Tamadar. Uh, Dr. Saeed. Uh, khair. Thank you very much for your lecture. It's uh, really wonderful. It made me miss this even more. Um, You're always welcome to count. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I also, I think maybe this is an addition and also there is a question that I have. So when you talked about the roads, uh, I've noticed while I was there, um, there are also uh, a very nice subtle way finding when, when you navigate through the city, which is when you say the roads that are going uh, narrower uh, towards more private area, even the floor uh, with the tub and, um, and the floor stones, actually, um, they have this sort of a, a pattern in the middle. So if you have two big tubes or two big stones, that means it's a main road and then it goes smaller. That's the branched or the secondary main road. And then it, it's such an interesting way finding technique that uh, if you're lost and apparently like, of course, if you're a tourist, you, you get lost very easily there. But once you see these things and once you notice uh, these um, floor uh, pattern, you can actually find your way out very easily or find your way to the main road. So I find it fascinating that such uh, such technique is being integrated in, in an early stage of the city. Uh, so, so that was just my addition. But uh, yeah. my question is, uh, I don't know if you have tapped into it before or not, but is there anything that the government uh, or the city of Ves is actually doing right now to sustain 
the urban identity of uh, of the city or um, uh, what is happening now basically sure sure let me let me uh, give me just one second let me share uh, uh, let me see if i can find it online because there is this uh, organism let me see if i can find it otherwise i'll just give you the the the, the name or share the name because they keep changing their website uh, on uh, so many times. Uh, but it is a, an official body that is in charge. Unfortunately, I don't, okay. So I'm just gonna share this on the screen. I, I, unfortunately, I was not able to find their website. It's gonna take me a little bit of time to do that, but I'm just gonna share. Uh, no problem. Uh, I'm trying to see where I can. Is there a place where I can type things? For some yeah, reason, I don't see copy it. and paste in the comments if you can see it. Uh, for some reason, I don't see where, where I can have comment. OK, maybe here, no? OK, uh, one second. There is a speech bubble uh, at the top. Uh, well, I've been using it for a long time, but for some reason, I don't see the bubble uh, on the. That's crazy. That's weird. Let me do it one more time. Uh, weird. I don't see the bubble, but anyway, that's fine. Uh, there is a yeah, yes. Now I can see it. Uh, no, not one. Well, it is acting weird because I had that. But I I use it all the time for my classes, but for some reason I don't see it on the. I think maybe because you're a guest. Uh, oh, maybe because I'm a guest. But anyway, so there is yeah. a, yes, I think that's what happened. So there is a, there is a, here's your answer. So there is a body, uh, an official body. Uh, 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 in French, it's called l'Agence pour la Didensification et la Réhabilitation de la Medina de Fès. So in English translation would go like this. So it's a, it's a, the national agency for uh, de-densification, meaning to reduce or to relieve uh, 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 demographic density and to re rehabilitate the city of Fez. This is an official body. I think it's part of the Ministry of Interior and it is mandated officially uh, 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 to basically address that very question or that th th those very issues that you talked about. Uh, uh, you know that demographic, the, the demographic pressure is causing a lot of problems. Uh, in the city of Fez, because remember what used to be uh, all these beautiful homes where in the past were basically uh, uh, occupied by uh, uh, single families, nuclear families and extended families. Mm -hmm. Many of those families start in 1912 with the with the 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 the, the, the building or the, the the construction or the foundation of the Ville Nouvelle prefer to live uh, in the in the Ville Nouvelle because it's much nicer and you can drive your car and you have access to all kinds of modern amenities. So many of those families, usually uh, well-off families, decided to leave the confines of the Medina and to basically settle in the European quarter for all kinds of reasons, you know, because many of them are now working or at the time working as clerks and uh, civil servants for the French government, for the French protectorate. And of course, it's human nature. You always want to use new gadgets. So the automobile was introduced in the early 20th century. And of course, it was impossible to drive inside the Medina. Because remember, this is something I forgot to talk about. Before 1912, no, no, no evidence in Moroccan cities of wheeled vehicles. So it's all beasts of burden and man porters. So to make a long story short, many of those houses eventually uh, became basically uh, occupied by lower income populations coming from the countryside. Mm -hmm. So you have this huge influx in terms of demographics uh, in the Medina of Fez, and that caused a lot of problems in terms of maintaining that kind of um, uh, caliber and that kind of uh, quality in terms of uh, 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 um, architecture and in terms of uh, public facilities, ma the maintenance of public facilities, etc. So one of the issues today is to relieve uh, or to reduce uh, 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 demographic pressure and of course to restore all these buildings 
private buildings or private units or domestic units or houses, but also public buildings. So mm -hmm. there are all kinds of mechanisms. And, and maybe later I will share this with the Professor Mejdi. There are all kinds of incentives. For example, the government would actually uh, 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 provide stipends uh, and monetary uh, 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 assistance to those households to actually restore their homes, but with the condition to use materials and expertise uh, under the under the supervision of the state. This way, for example, you're not supposed to use steel, you're not supposed to use le beton armé, you know, concrete. This way to keep the integrity of the buildings and to keep this kind of feel uh, uh, of the city as a UNESCO World Heritage, because you have the mandate and you have the label UNESCO World Heritage, and there are yeah. all kinds of restrictions as to what kind of material you're supposed to use to restore public buildings and, mm. and private homes. So to answer your question, yes, there is a body and it's very, I think it has been working for many decades now. I forgot when it was founded, but that's, I think right after the getting the label, the UNESCO label, the government decided to basically uh, 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 establish this, this particular government body to take care of, of the city affairs. So what, I'm, what I would like to say now is that a lot of work has been done but we're not there yet mm. in terms of restoration. You will be surprised when you come to Fez, you will see that many of the madrasas have been restored, fully restored. You can actually do that on Google Images today after this lecture. If you go, for example, Abu Inaniya Madrasa, Attarin Madrasa, Misbahia Madrasa, yeah. Uh, yeah. you will see the, the, the before and after. And they did some great work in terms of restoring this uh, these public spaces. Uh, and of course, for, for, for domestic units, there are all kinds of issues in terms of inheritance, in terms of encouraging the population to do that, etc. We great. have uh, some very interesting questions, three more uh, questions, and we have to finish uh, soon sure. because there is a lecture at 11.30, but I'll ask them and if you could uh, shortly uh, answer them. So the first question is from Rawan, is there a reason why the inner courtyards don't involve uh, greenery? Is that related to the status of the inhabitants? Uh, the inner courtyard, why it doesn't uh, involve much greenery landscape inside the uh, greenery meaning uh, meaning plants and uh, okay. Uh, 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 remember, there are there are two. Okay, so historically speaking, today of course, Fez looks very different from what it used to be. But they were inside the Medina, within the confines of the Medina. You had all kinds of. Um, of uh, what we call uh, jnans or 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 uh, or public gardens okay so it used to have a lot of green okay so of course uh, 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 access to open spaces and to green and to 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 this kind of um, uh, 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 landscapes was available to the the residents of Fez within the confines of the of the Medina uh, of course today it's different because of demographic pressure. Every single square inch is 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 has been used up. So that's one aspect. The second aspect, it it also gives you an idea about the socioeconomic status of the resident. Larger houses would usually have that. Uh, would have some sort of uh, private gardens uh, 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 within the confines of the domestic unit. But usually, uh, because of the pressure on 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 the on the on the on the residential space, uh, usually the, the, the courtyard, you will find the fountain for all kinds of reasons because the, you need the water for all kinds of uh, daily chores, you need the water for the sound, you need the water for drinking, and usually the w access to green space is usually available outside uh, within the confines of the Medina or for larger houses, there is usually some sort of spot where you have that kind of private garden. All right, uh, we'll take two more questions. There is a uh, Ms. Nurshan from uh, University of Carthage in Tunisia, a colleague of mine. Uh, Ms. Nurshan, please go ahead. Uh, hello, I'm hello. Uh, Nurshan Fatma. I'm a PhD researcher and the lecturer at uh, uh, Ecole Nationale d'Architecture in Tunisia. Uh, actually, I want to thank you for this great presentation and fluent presentation. Thank you. And uh, I think uh, I'm thinking about the similarities, there is really uh, similarities between uh, between the Tunisia uh, uh, Medina of Tunis and uh, I think a lot of other uh, Medina in uh, Maghreb or even in the Middle East. And I was wondering about the 
different difference and the similarities between that cities and you have said that there is not uh, only about climate and uh, we can see rational uh, idea or rational factors but there is also uh, other factors like religions and uh, ideology and maybe cultural etc uh, etc et and i'm referring in this about uh, to the book of Amos Rapoport l'anthropologie d'une maison where he said that uh, maybe irrational factors like the re re religion are the determinant factors in uh, in uh, the construction and the, the identity of, of houses. So, so I want to ask you maybe uh, there is uh, uh, if there is uh, uh, researchers or uh, like uh, think like that who uh, points the the difference and the similarities between this architecture and the factor who. Uh, um, um, participate to this, uh, uh, this sim uh, similarities and difference. Maybe we make uh, we can make a comparative study to understand this uh, this uh, similarity. The second question is about the uh, modernization modernity. Uh, modernities and how we can uh, modernize the cities because uh, here in Tunisia, for example, uh, people don't want to to live anymore in uh, open on a courtyard house. And in some houses where they want to be modern, they try to cover to cover even to cover the courtyards. Maybe we have to think about uh, uh, not uh, ways to modernize. Uh, this uh, architecture and thank sure. you a lot sure. my, my my pleasure thank you for this uh, very very uh, important questions uh, uh, again i wrote this uh, almost 20 years ago uh, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to um, to uh, attribute every single structural feature or architectural feature to to religion because it is a little bit dangerous to 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 do that uh, because we have examples of uh, of uh, even even in in we have examples of some of the patterns i discussed today even in mesopotamian architecture okay so i really think that uh, it needs a lot of thinking and it needs a lot of um, uh, 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 caution to look into these issues for example, it's very easy to just say, and I think almost simplistic to say that we have this because of religion or we have this because of uh, 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 this particular verses of Quran or it's a little bit dangerous to do that because it's really very complex. Yes, we have the religion. And of course, we have the expert here, Professor Majdi on Ahkam al Bunyan. There is definitely a religious component, but there is also what I would call uh, uh, socio sociocultural factors, patriarchy, for example. You know this idea of separation between male domain and female domains okay that's also important and that's not necessarily about religion because arab society was a patriarchal society before islam uh, there is also uh, the environment and the climate you know when it, if it's too hot you need to find architectural mechanisms or structural mechanisms to address that so i think i'm assuming your phd students i really if there is one Thing I would like to tell you personally as a university student, as a PhD student, I want you to take it higher. I mean, take this, this is 20 years ago, and look at it with the with the with lenses of 21st century in terms of the literature available and in terms of uh, a new set of uh, a new 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 setting in terms of epistemological setting, if you like. Okay. Uh, uh, don't reduce it to, to religion. Religion is just one factor among many others. So that's one the, the, the first part. The second part is people do not, uh, uh, when you said how to modernize uh, 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 Medinas. I think there is a uh, another chapter by the same author of this book, Basim Hakim. Uh, there is a very, very, uh, and I would like to see, uh, I, like, I would like to see uh, Professor Mejdi to share this with you guys since I don't have access to the chat bar. You yeah. know, there is this very, Seminal work, two volumes: the city in the in the in the Islamic world. Uh, sorry, the, the yeah, the city in the in the Islamic world. It's a Brill publisher. Uh, do, do you know this book? You know the two volumes. 
by uh, uh, it's it's a collection of chapters uh, the city in the islamic world are you familiar with that see majdi yes by uh, juc yes exactly so Another if you could book. share those two if you could share the links or at least the 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 reference uh, to this book it's a two volume book and one of the chapters by basim hakim is about this a very specific question of yours in terms of how to use you know all these models that i talked about in this article and to take that to another level in terms of modern modernizing the medinas and making the medina uh, uh, a sustainable space or space that is also uh, a space where it's comfortable to live in the 21st century okay uh, 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 since we're running out of time i think that chapter is really very rich in terms of giving you all kinds of uh, 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 not suggestions but uh, but ideas as to how to take that to 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 another level I think we're, uh, I cannot ask my question, but I'd like uh, Ms. Leila to ask her question. Please, Please. go ahead, Ms. Leila. Uh, we... Are you sure, Dr. Majdi? Yes. Is there a time? Uh, let's ask your question and then finish. I think we're uh, running. Maybe I will have to. <laughs> You're getting greedy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Said. Again, Leila speaking to you. Um, I just, uh, first of all, I would like to say that it was very interesting to me to actually um, hear from the beginning of your presentation how the city of Fez uh, in a way grew and developed in three stages. And um, uh, it's interesting because we have the same scenario actually in Bosnia, where the longitudinal city um, started with the, um, you know, during the Ottoman era, and then it came the Austro-Hungarian period, and then it came the new period as well, where um, it's very clear, almost like a knife sh sharp cut, where when you go and you walk, you actually really can see the that cut that where the Ottoman stop and then the Austro-Hungarian. And so um, I don't know whether the same kind of a scenario is uh, also in a Fez or um, maybe it's more blended than it is in the uh, scenario of Sarajevo. The other thing I wanted, um, you touch upon the preservation of the madrasas, but I know that Fez is very, very rich with the heritage of hammams. And I know that around six, seven years ago, there was a notion even funded by the certain European institution to really, uh, again, um, preserve and um, conserve as well the, the hammam. So I was just wondering if anything in that regard happened. And the last, <laughs> Dr. Mejdi, sorry. <laughs> and the last point is about actually your uh, presentation of the um, courtyards and compound houses. Um, Tamader is laughing. Sorry, Tamader. Um, uh, I know that, you know, it is something that model we can see it in in, in Fez, we can see it in Sarajevo, we can see it in, in Central Asia, we can see it here in Bahrain, that model is very repetitive, um, and this is the beauty of it. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, it was always the main model was do not do a harm. That was something not to do the harm. Um, I would just like you to refer to modern time where to a certain extent I feel that um, concept of do not do the harm is kind of a loss because now we see the cars uh, in those narrow alleys that are blocking the roads. Um, neighbors building the upper floor don't care about the view and the privacy of the other. So I don't know whether you can a little bit draw some parallel um, of the all time and um, what is going on today and i promise i finish sure <laughs> thank you thank you thank you very much that's like another lecture uh, uh, uh but but anyway i'm gonna uh, try to be brief but at the same time to be uh, uh, informative so first question uh, the separation uh, yes you can feel it uh, uh, if you're walking the, the the one of the avenues or one of the uh, streets of the European city, uh, you 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 see the difference. You feel the difference. Even I mean, you feel it even physically. 
because of the of the drop in temperature. It's, for example, if you're walking in one of the main avenues of uh, of uh, of the European city, uh, uh, Avenue de France at the time, uh, uh, and then you walk into the Medina, you, you, even physically you feel that you feel that uh, it's cooler inside the Medina, and that's something I talked about in the lecture. You feel it visually because we're looking at two different uh, 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 two different architectural models. Uh, uh, the Medina model and the European city model. But let me just end with this. It was meant to be that way because the first French, the first uh, 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 French uh, 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 resident general made a point or made it a requirement or made it actually into, the, into law to make a separation between the Medinas and the Vinouvel. They did not want to replicate the same model that they did or the same mistakes that they did in Algeria. Okay, remember, Algeria was a French colony from 1830. When the French basically uh, came to Morocco and Morocco became a protectorate, a number of mistakes that were uh, uh, made in in the Algerian uh, in the Algerian context, where the the French were very careful not to repeat them in in Morocco. I'm not sure about Tunisia, but it was made into law to make a separation, uh, even. They even specify the number of meters. I think I, I don't have the figure off the top of my head, but they made clear that there should be a separation, usually with some sort of a landscape, uh, 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 some sort of landscaping uh, to mark this kind of separation. So that's the first question. The second question, yes, hammams are also included uh, uh, within this program of restoration of uh, public buildings, uh, including private hammams uh, inside the Medina. As a matter of fact, uh, and this is also linked to the Tunisian PhD students from earlier. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, uh, many private homes were actually transformed into uh, uh, businesses, uh, what we call bed and breakfast, what we call actually the term Riyadh. So many houses, private houses, especially the big ones, were transformed into bed and breakfast or R&B uh, businesses. And some of those hammams were restored for to cater to 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 uh, 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 customers or to new clientele uh, coming to these places. So that's the answer is yes, both at the level of public buildings, public hammams, and at the level of private hammams within the context of riyads. The last element in terms of the in terms of the la uh, darara uh, wa principles that were implemented in the past and that somehow are not really implemented today. Uh, I would say that there are all kinds of, uh, of of ways to approach this. The first one, I'm gonna come back to Basim Hakim because he talked about that uh, in his uh, chapter in the in the in the two volume book by uh, by Jayusi, you know the, the the city in the Islamic world. So I would maybe like you guys to go back to that uh, chapter because he was way more um, uh, specific as to how to come back to that ideal model uh, uh, somehow uh, of, of, of the past. But let me just add this. Uh, 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 there is also a question, a sociocultural uh, bedding to this kind of answer, because what used to be a closely knit uh, 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 sociocultural structure, because if you look at the uh, if if you look at the article that I uh, uh, upon which I you I I base my talk today, there is some sort of uh, of a link between the different units. If you're going from the nuclear family to the extended family to the quarters of the city, there is some sort of mechanism linking all these individuals and all these groups. And it was to the best interest to all these groups and individuals to keep the city running and to keep law and order. Today that has collapsed because now maybe uh, uh, occupants of two houses have nothing to do with each other because you know that 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 model had had had, had broken. Okay, what used to be a nuclear family and extended family and all that uh, is broken because those families had left, and now you have sometimes several families within the same domestic unit, and they have no links to each other. So that basically caused a lot of issues and crises in terms of how to run the city. And of course, you have a top-down approach as what used to be a bottom-up approach. Uh, 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 in the medieval model. I hope I answered your question.
Yes, thank you. thank you very much, Professor Said. Thank you very thank much. You so much all. Thank you very much, Professor Said, for the uh, wealth of details on Islamic urbanism in Medina. First, apologies to our colleagues at uh, Sapienza University in Rome because we took some 10 minutes of their time. Uh, we'll make sure not to do it next time. So I hope we will keep this discussion, continue this discussion, have probably comparative studies between Medina of Tunis, Medina of Fes, in, in the future, and uh, uh, it was really very interesting to us. I didn't get to share much because of the uh, time constraints, and I wanted to offer an opportunity to my colleagues to share their thoughts, reflections, but uh, this is just the start of discussion, and it will continue, inshallah, in the future. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. And if you'd like to join the other lecture, please feel free. Uh, please Dr. send me the link. Uh, if if you're if, if if I would really want would like to be part of the loop, so I would really like to participate to participate as a as a, as an attendee to the future webinars organized by your department. It, it would be my honor to participate as an attendee. Sure, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, Dr. Said, thank you very much. You're yeah, more My than pleasure. welcome to be with us. You already now your uh, your uh, email with us, and e um, every event shall I will receive um, so SMS much. from us. So it's a great honor to have you with us again. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nash, you thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now we will start. We'll uh, have about five minutes of break. Then we can uh, join to uh, Dr. Sara. Uh, her lecture should be, should start at 11 o'clock, but we apologize for this late starting uh, because of this interesting lecture. Uh, Professor uh, Roberto, more than welcome, and uh, it is great honor to have you with us today. And we uh, will just uh, take a breath because we need to have some stretches. Then we can start with uh, Dr. Sara within uh, 10 minutes if you.